Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. Today we are finishing up the Anne Marie Fahey case and just as a heads up, I do have other multi-parters that I want to create. They are admittedly my favorite content to make. I really enjoy diving deep, I enjoy finding everything out, but I've also been collecting suggestions and requests from you all, cases that I can make coffee and crime times on, so I have several of those coming down the pike. Um, these are more current cases when I do coffee and crime times usually, which actually makes them a little bit harder, and that's why I do the deep dives uh, in between to sort of cleanse my palate and give me a break. But I am going to be in Denver between the 1st and 3rd of February because I'm going to be a guest on the Mile Higher podcast with Kendall Ray. So, so excited. And it's also my first trip to Denver. I've never been there before. So at this point, the thing I'm most excited about is getting to explore the Denver International Airport. I'm super pumped about it. I'll say hi to Blucifer for you guys. Um, if you have not seen my video on DIA and the supposed like creepy and mysterious things that surround that airport, I will link the video in the description box below. But once I get back, I'll get right into the booth. I'll put out a bunch of coffee and crime times for the people who aren't the biggest fan of my long form content. Now, today's video is sponsored by the best true crime podcast in the world, Crime Weekly. That's right, I'm investing in myself today and I am taking the sponsored portion of this video to give a shout out to Crime Weekly, the podcast that I co-host with retired police detective Derek Lavasser. I personally think Crime Weekly is great. It's a little bit of a different format than we do here. So with Crime Weekly, what happens is I'm usually doing the research and I'm narrating the case. And then Derek, he pops in with actual and real law enforcement knowledge and tips and sort of behind the scenes. So if I say something like, well, why wouldn't they search there instead of there? He would say, well, they do it in a grid, so they do it this way. You know, stuff like that. I really don't know what I'm talking about. He does. That's why he's a good addition. We still started the podcast a year ago, so there's a lot of episodes on audio right now. We also, about six months after we started the podcast, we started a YouTube channel for the podcast. So not all of our cases are up on YouTube, but most of our very long series are up on YouTube. Right now, we are finishing up what is going to be an eight-part series on Kaylee Anthony. We are recording that final part this coming Monday, so that will probably be out um, within you know a couple of days of you seeing this. We've also done a series series on Lacey Peterson, which I, I, th I think both the Lacey Peterson and the Kaylee Anthony series are amazing. We go so deep. We cover every little detail. We're trying to sort of figure out with these cases because there's so much question about, did Scott Peterson do it? And there's so many questions about, you know, did Casey Anthony do it? Yeah, she did. But there's all these questions that surround these cases. And in order to figure out what the actual answer is, we have to go really deep and we have to examine every piece of evidence as if we were detectives looking at this case. On YouTube, you can also find our Asia Degree case, one of the favorite cases that I've done because the um, the mystery of what happened to little Asia is haunting, I think, for a lot of people, for me as well. So we did that case. We do a lot of cases on YouTube as well as audio. I'm going to link all of the links in the description box, so go and check the podcast out. It is really amazing. Like, listen to these reviews, okay? I love Stephanie on YouTube. Thank you. And so I was resistant to Stephanie and Derek together at first, but now I'm a mega fan. I listen to the audio and watch the videos when they're posted. Thank you, Aries girl. Another review is titled Obsessed, and it says, So I stumbled upon this podcast randomly. I found the Casey Anthony cases and got sucked in. As I'm listening, I recognized Derek's voice. I realized he was off Big Brother. I loved watching him there, and I love listening to him here. New favorite podcast ever. Thank you so much, Chris Astorga. Manda Panda says, I've listened to every episode and I believe this is my favorite true crime podcast ever. Going back to the beginning to truly understand why the crimes were committed is so crucial to me and I feel like many podcasts out there are lazy for not diving as deep. Thank you, Manda Panda. I don't know if they're lazy. They may not just be as interested as we are, but thank you guys so much. And there's hundreds more reviews just like that. People really love Crime Weekly and we think you will too. So I'm going to play you a couple of clips from our episodes just so you can get an idea. It'll be really short and then we'll dive in. But Lacey, she felt that she knew Scott was the one from the moment she met him. I mean, she went back to the cafe to be like, dude, what's wrong with you? I'm amazing. Why didn't you call me? <laughs> and she wanted her mother's stamp of approval. And Scott knew that she wanted Sharon's stamp of approval. So he had to get it or else it, it probably would have ended there, honestly. 
Yeah, no. I, I'm I'm loving that we're going so deep into this because some of this may seem trivial, but when we come to the end of this and we're giving opinions on theories as to whether or not Scott killed his wife, I want those opinions to be based in the whole story or as much of the story as we can. There's still some people online who, who think that they might have had something to do with it. I'm not surprised by that. I personally don't. Um, I'm not saying they do yeah. either. I'm just saying I'm no, not surprised know, that that, that should not. cross yeah. people's mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should. It should be something that that you consider, anyways. If you're if you're into true crime and you're looking at these cases from a, a standpoint of critical thinking and kind of keeping an open mind, of course that should be something you look at. Um, right. There's a reason the case hasn't been solved yet. Yes, and that leads me to talk about that picture. That picture that was found in the Turner's barn, because to me. <laughs> It's one of the strangest parts of this case. That picture has never been identified. It's been posted online. The police have asked, you know, anyone know who this little girl is? Like, are you this little girl? Did you know this little girl? Is this your child? Still to this day, no one has come forward with any information about it. Well, let's talk about how Corey acted after Lauren disappeared. Corey Rossman's attorneys told the press that <laughs> Corey may have sustained a concussion from being punched that night by uh, Zach Oates. And he could not remember why the fight had happened. And he couldn't remember much of anything that happened after that. So this was like the the narrative that was coming out from his lawyers for a while. So I get what you're saying. It's I'm just I'm just I always try to play devil's advocate, even when I don't believe in it myself, because I know that we, we've seen it at trial with these co cases where these defense attorneys come up with these crazy explanations and we just we just like put our hands in our face because we can't believe that's the angle they're going with. I try to I try to preemptively think of them, even if I don't believe in them personally. Is that are you following what I'm saying? Like it is. It's crazy to think four against one could ever be considered self-defense. But that's kind of the mindset that I was trying to put myself in as I was going through this. Like it, it's a possibility, I I guess. Well, I'm glad you're playing devil's advocate so I don't have to, because if it was The Rock <laughs> against you and your brother and then your clone and your brother's clone, I think that you could easily kind of hold back The Rock so you wouldn't have to beat him to death, right? No matter what he did. I, I We could render him, yeah, unable to, you know, unable to further hurt anybody. Plus, you did say I was pretty tall. You're very you tall. Me. And when law enforcement went to pull over the van, it swerved and struck a curb before coming to a stop. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot in there and we're going to we're going to dive into it in two seconds. And, you know, my initial thought just from hearing this in the kind of the order to me, it almost sounds like the person the person who said that he struck her to me saw what happened before this person did. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, yes. I know we're going to get into it where Gabby's telling the police I hit him first. But it sounds to me like the second, the first person you discussed saw Gabby get into the van. the The other person saw them before they got in the van. Yeah, and so it, it might seemed like one guy pulled up, got out of his car, and he was like going to walk across the street to the co op, but he stopped because he was watching what was happening on the other side of the street, which was Brian and Gabby. And then this other person, the one who called nine one one, because this initial person who was standing across the street, he said he found a police officer physically and told him what happened and then gave him like his information to contact him. Okay, so don't forget to check out Crime Weekly. As always, links are in the description box. Come over to our YouTube channel, say hello, say you're coming from my channel, and I will see you there. Let's dive in to today's video. Okay, so I want to start with something that we ended with last time. The words of Eugene Moore Jr., the Delaware attorney Tom had hired to represent him after his previous lawyer, Joseph Hurley, quit because apparently Joseph Hurley had had a conversation with God and God was like, Joe, what are you doing with this this freaking Tom Capano guy, man? I mean, you've, you've had some pretty shifty clients, but this one takes the cake. Eugene Moore would soon find out that his new high-profile client was truly a big enough pain in the ass for God to emerge from his perch in the heavens to chat with Joseph Hurley. Now, I played a clip of Maurer talking about his experience with Tom Capano. And at the end of that clip, Maurer said something very important. He said, quote, There were two Tom Capanos. There was the one Tom Capano who was generous and who helped St. Anthony's, gave them a lot of money, and at times would volunteer his time. He could be charming and affable when he wanted to be. 
But when Tom, as I learned, did not get what he wanted, when he wanted it, his mind closed and was like a steel trap, and he would be ruthless in terms of getting what he wanted. And he had this sense that everyone owed him fealty or loyalty to him because he was such a good person to them. And that's how he felt about this girl. He felt he had rescued her and done this and done that and how dare she go off with another guy and be happy. The sad part is that he could have been a good person, but the other side of him took over. End quote. This is incredibly astute coming from Eugene Moore. And he understood this about Tom simply because he worked for him. Not because they were in a romantic relationship, not because they were friends, not because they were family, not because Tom Capano was dedicating hundreds of hours of his own time to exert his control and pressure on the lawyer. If Eugene Moore felt this way, felt this intensely about Tom Capano, imagine how Anne-Marie felt. Eugene was never Tom's actual or true target, but Anne-Marie was for years. Debbie McIntyre was scheduled to testify on Tom's behalf during his bail hearing. That would happen on February 2nd. And until the night before, she had actually planned to do it. She'd really planned to sit on the stand and commit perjury in order to help her lover of over a decade get out of prison. But by the morning of, Debbie sat down and she wrote a letter to Tom telling him she would not be seeing him in court that day. She said, quote, possibly I could get myself in serious trouble and I'm not willing to take that risk. Deep in your heart, I know you have to agree with me. So, my love, this is the first time in all the years of our relationship that I have done something for myself, not to sacrifice myself to please somebody else. I know right now you don't believe me and might go as far as to say that my lack of presence cost you your bail if you don't get it. End quote. Once again, this is an indication that Tom has a pattern. The fact that he would have the balls to tell Debbie that her not showing up cost him his bail shows how blamative he can be. Nothing is ever his fault. If anything negative happens to him, it's because of somebody else. It's not that you committed a crime and landed yourself behind bars. It's that Debbie won't come and testify for you and lie on your behalf to get you out from behind those bars. Whenever something good happens, Tom wants to take all the credit. When something bad happens, it's everyone else's fault. Now, Debbie did not show up to defend Tom, so she finally makes a good and logical decision. But Tom's two brothers, Lewis and Jerry, did show up to tell their stories to a waiting audience who would be hearing some of these details for the first time. After five days of testimony, Judge William Swain Lee denied Tom bail, and Tom was transported back to solitary confinement, where he wrote Debbie a long letter telling her how hurt and disappointed he was by her decision. He told her, quote, I've been abandoned in my time of need by most of the people I cared about and who I thought cared about me. I would have bet my life on your unlimited devotion and loyalty, end quote. That's a bad bet, Tom. Bad bet. Hope you're not a gambler. And let's be honest, Tom wasn't going to bet his life on Debbie's loyalty and devotion. Tom was going to bet his life on his powers of manipulation. And once again, the only thing Tom cared about was his own life. Tom had made a decision to murder someone, and now he was facing the music for that. He'd pulled an ignorant Debbie into his plan, putting her life in jeopardy. And even though she had woken up before committing perjury, Debbie would not escape the mess he had created unscathed. The Tatnell School, where Debbie worked, she'd worked there for years. They were so embarrassed by Debbie's affiliation with Tom and then their affiliation with Debbie that they forced her to resign. And Debbie became a centerpiece of the case in the media, where they referred to her as Capano's mistress. I mean, can you imagine all the things that you've done in your life, all the things you've accomplished? And she was quite accomplished. You know, the children you've had, the lives you've touched— And that's what you're boiled down to on the front page. On February 26th, Debbie wrote Tom a letter to let him know that she was going to be meeting with the prosecution again. And this time she planned to be completely truthful. Tom wrote her back, going through all the stages of grief in one long letter. Obviously minus the final stage of grief, which is acceptance, which 
Tom never reached. Tom never reached acceptance. Stage one, denial and isolation. Tom told Debbie, quote, how can you say you love me and in the next breath tell me you won't keep my letters because your new lawyer wants you to give them to him? What conclusion can I draw from that? That he's more important to you than I am? That perhaps I can't trust you? That you don't care about or love me? End quote. See, Debbie had fired the lawyer that Tom had suggested she hire, and she'd hired a lawyer that her ex-husband told her to hire. And she really liked this new lawyer, and she trusted him, and the new lawyer was like, yo, this dude's been taking you for a ride for years, and when he writes you letters, I want you to give them to me. So Tom was very unhappy with that. Stage two, anger. Tom wrote to Debbie, quote, I can feel myself getting angry and again feeling the sense of betrayal I felt when you abandoned me at the bail hearing. Do you love me or not? End quote. Stage three, bargaining. Quote, I will sacrifice the huge amount of money I have already spent, nearly $500,000. I ask only that you give up someone who is a stranger, not a friend, someone you've known for only a few weeks and met only a few times, someone who cannot have cost you much yet. End quote. Once again, he's talking about her lawyer because her lawyer is giving her good advice at this point. Her lawyer is telling her things that are logical and making her wake up. And Tom doesn't want that. Like a typical abusive spouse or an abusive partner, Tom wants to isolate Debbie from all the people who can speak to her in reasonable terms. Stage four, depression. Tom told Debbie, quote, if you're going to crush me and perhaps destroy my spirit, it's better that you do it now than later so I can at least try to recover, although I doubt I ever will, end quote. <laughs> that was fun. On February 27th, Debbie met with the prosecution and she accepted a blanket immunity deal. In exchange, Debbie would need to admit that she had lied to the police. She would also have to swear that she had not had anything to do with Anne Marie's murder and she'd have to promise to cooperate completely. Now, don't get it twisted. At this point, Debbie still loved Tom Capano. She was still communicating with him almost every single day, whether by letter or by phone. And there was still a large part of her that felt he could be innocent, but she was not going to be taken down with him. So she agreed to start recording her calls with him. Tom, on the other hand, was fishing around for friends and allies since he'd been left with essentially zero of either. From his perch behind bars, Tom Capano would still find a way to orchestrate things on the outside. He would still find a way to intimidate those on the outside who had turned on him, to put pressure on them, and to scare them into doing what he wanted. Nick Perello was a long-term drug addict who'd been in and out of prison for the past two decades. And during the time that Tom Capano was his cell neighbor in prison, Perello was facing life behind bars for being a habitual criminal who had participated in theft and forgery in order to feed his drug habit. Previously, Tom had asked Perello to call Debbie McIntyre on the phone, reminding her to stick to the story and to keep her mouth shut because Tom knew that his phone calls were being recorded and paid attention to, but there was a chance that nobody was going to be paying much attention to Nick Perello's phone calls. But now that Debbie had completely abandoned Tom, he had a different request for his new prison buddy. On February 27th, after Debbie made her deal with the prosecution, Tom asked Nick Perello if he had some friends on the outside who would possibly be willing to break into Debbie's house to send her a message. Now, Perello, who's smart, you know, oftentimes these, these lifelong convicts are, are smart or street smart, at least. They're smart with self-preservation. And Nick Perello saw Tom's trust in him as a tool he could use to benefit himself, to get a transfer to a better prison, maybe time taken off of his sentence, et cetera, et cetera. So Perello sent a letter to his lawyer letting him know what Tom was planning, saying, quote, Jesus, I think the bastard killed her, and he's trying to destroy anyone that gets in his way, end quote. Obviously, Perello's talking about Anne Marie when he says he thinks Tom killed her. And when he's talking about he's trying to destroy anyone that gets in his way, he's referring at this point to Debbie, but she wasn't the only person that was going to be a target for Tom. Perello met with Colm Connolly on March 11th, and he showed him a four-page map of Debbie McIntyre's house that Tom Capano had drawn by hand along with a bunch of information like Debbie's security system code, which door to go in, where to turn when you went in in case it was dark. 
Tom had also given a detailed list of instructions of what should happen when Debbie's house was broken into. He said that they must shatter the floor-to-ceiling mirror on the wall in the master bedroom. He said that was absolutely required. Tom said they must also locate and remove a plastic bag with sex toys and videos in a closet that would be in the master bedroom suite or possibly under the bed. Tom also said that all the art in Debbie's home was original and valuable, and he wanted the burglars, the ham burglars, to remove all of the art, like steal it or slash it and destroy it. This guy was shameless, unscrupulous. Destroy her art? Like, come on, man, right? It's... It's like a little kid who isn't getting what he wants. So he starts drawing on the walls and acting out. And another bit of insight from somebody who has dealt with a lot of people like this. When your partner or somebody you're close to reacts in such an inflated way to something you've done, and they do this consistently over a period of time, you start to almost be conditioned to believe that you've done something warranting that response, right? So Debbie... I guess you could say she betrayed Tom, but not really. In reality, what she did was say, like, I'm done. I can't stand by your side anymore. I have to be honest. Technically, that's the right thing to do. Technically, that's the moral thing to do. But the way Tom reacted was as if Debbie had done something far, far worse. He reacted in a way that wasn't representative of what she had done. He has the right to feel hurt. He has the right to feel betrayed. He has the right to, you know, be sensitive and be in his feelings about it. But going this far, and he goes further, by the way, going this far, I mean, to say it's making a mountain out of a molehill would be an understatement. So obviously, now the prosecution has Nick Perello. They know what Tom's planning. And when Debbie was informed of Tom's plans, she sort of stopped opening his letters altogether. He kept sending them every day. But Debbie would get them, she wouldn't open them, and she'd hand them right over to her lawyer without even reading them. And I can't honestly believe that he had the balls to keep writing to her after that. You know, like, I know that I was sending a bunch of guys to break into your house and, like, steal your stuff and and mess your place up. I'm so sorry. I love you so much. He even wrote a several-page letter to Debbie's 15-year-old son begging him to help his mother see the light. Shameless, like I said. Sometimes shameless is a good thing. Not in Tom Capano's case. But Debbie was not Tom's only target, not by far. The same month, Nick Perello handed over the map of Debbie's house, another inmate came forward. Wilfredo Rosa told the prosecution that Tom had asked him how much it would cost to have his own brother, Jerry, taken out. When I say taken out, I mean killed. Tom was willing to have his own little brother killed to save his skin. Tom had also asked Rosa to add Debbie to the hit list, even while he was writing her countless letters apologizing for arranging to have her house broken into. He even gave Rosa pictures of Debbie. He gave her her dress, her alarm code, all of that stuff, just so he could make sure the right person was neutralized. So luckily, Rosa came forward and told the prosecution about this plan. And at this point, Debbie's like, I can't believe that I thought I loved this person, right? And sometimes in a very toxic relationship like this, it takes something very drastic to wake you up and make you realize like you did think you loved them. You genuinely did think you loved them, but you didn't. And they certainly never loved you. Now, just as they had done with Jerry, as each new witness came out, Capano's legal team blasted them in public, waving their dirty laundry around and highlighting every mistake they had ever made in their lives in order to discredit them. So obviously, um, Nick Perello and Wilfredo Rosa, they are prisoners, so they have a criminal background. So Tom's defense team is like, look at these lying liars, these criminals. Like, how would you ever believe a criminal? Which is funny because like, your client. And like, look at this Debbie person. You know, she sleeps around. She's a big liar. And she's just mad that Tom was seeing Anne-Marie and now she's trying to make him pay for it. So they have all these stories to come out with to try to make these people look bad. And that is something that Derek and I actually talked about in the Kaylee Anthony series uh, this past episode, where I said, that's the one problem I have with defense attorneys. Like, I realize you have to do your job. You have to defend your client. Everybody deserves representation. But when that defense attorney starts pointing fingers at innocent people and trying to blame them for the crime or pull them into the crime just to cause reasonable doubt, just to take the attention off of their client. At that 
point, you're ruining people's lives, their reputations, they're losing jobs, they're losing friends, they're losing credibility amongst their community. I have a big problem with that. I think that that should be um, not allowed. But Wilfredo Rosa, who had taken Nick Perello's cell when Perello had been moved out after giving evidence against Tom, he shocked the prosecution when he told Colm Connolly that of all the people Tom wanted out of the picture, aka dead, Connolly was number one. Connolly told Delaware Online, quote, Capano hated me. He took everything personally. He was an egomaniac. He was offended if anybody rejected him. That was why he ultimately killed Anne-Marie Fahey. He had a history and a pattern and practice of that. And we knew just the way he made the response to me, I hope you sleep at night. And what he was saying to other witnesses, we knew he hated me, end quote. Like I said, when Debbie found out about Tom's plan to have her killed, she knew that she'd been blinded for years. She knew she had become just another victim of a malignant narcissist when she thought she was actually important to this person. And I feel bad for that because that has to hurt. Jury selection began on October 6, 1998, and it took roughly three weeks to pick the 12 jurors and their six alternates. Judge William Swain Lee recalled those three weeks as very memorable. Um, so apparently the people who knew about the court process and knew about like juries and stuff, they couldn't really understand why Tom's legal team was allowing all these jurors to sit on the jury. So apparently the third, fourth and fifth jury members who were selected, they happened to be attractive women in their 20s and 30s. Judge Swain Lee said, quote, under the circumstances, that wasn't what you expected the defense to be allowing, end quote. And the reason why this would typically not be the best idea was because Tom's victim, Anne Marie, had been a young, attractive woman. Judge Swain Lee said that Tom's attorneys, I think it was Joe um, O'Terry, he'd approached the bench after these three women were selected, and O'Terry wanted to go on the record that he and Tom's legal team had given Tom advice to dismiss these three women. But Tom had insisted that these women be on the jury. And Joe O'Terry asked the judge, Judge Swain Lee, who I love, by the way. Judge Swain Lee is awesome. He's very smart and he's fair and he's, uh, he's really sweet and he seems to have a good understanding of, like, compassion, which you don't always see in, in the justice system or the legal system. But anyways, O'Terry asks the judge, can I say something off the record? And Judge Swain Lee was like, yeah, go for it. And O'Terry said, quote, the dumb son of a bitch thinks they're going to fall in love with him, end quote. Judge Swain Lee told Delaware Online, quote, and I think that was true. He thought he was going to be able to charm them, end quote. <laughs> so Tom, such an egomaniac, such a narcissist. He's like, uh, if it's one place that I pull well with, it's with the ladies. He's reliable with the ladies. There are so many to deflower. Ladies, looks proximity to power. Sorry. Tom Capano, in his current condition, was not going to charm anyone. I mean, besides the fact that he's a creepy, saggy sort of psychopath, uh, Tom had lost a good deal of weight. He always complained about the prison food and he wasn't eating well. And obviously he's not going outside a lot because he's only let out of his cell one hour a day. So his skin had yellowed. It was hanging limply to his bones. He looked emaciated is how they described him. On Monday, October 26th, the murder trial of Tom Capano began. Anne-Marie Fahey's family were there. So were some members of Tom's family, especially the ones who were not testifying against him, like his brother Joe, his sister Marion, and his mother Marguerite. His wife Kay and three out of four of their daughters were also there. His oldest daughter was away at college. And obviously, you don't hear much about Kay and the girls in these videos. And there's two reasons for that. There are some things out there about them, such as like what, what schools the girls went to, you know, things about them, some stuff about Kay. But I, I, there's not a lot out there about them, and I think that's that's done purposefully because they really didn't want to be involved. They really wanted to avoid that three-ring circus, and because I could sense that they wanted to avoid that, even the, the small details I found out about them, I didn't really include in here. Somebody actually wrote in my last YouTube video on this case that um, she or he had checked onto the girls on like Instagram and found that they were doing really well and they seemed to have left it all behind them. And they deserve that. They deserve their privacy. They deserve their peace. They deserve joy, especially after having the unlucky um, chance, I guess, of being born 
to Tom Capano. But I also do want to say that that they always said he was a good father. They loved him very much. So even if they realize and recognize the, the evil thing that he did, that's still their father. And they're, they're always going to love him. At least a part of them will always love him. So we can't really judge them for that. And I just want everyone to understand like how difficult this would be as a young girl, as a teenage girl, to have your father go on trial for murder in such a small place like Wilmington. It must have been very difficult for them. And then three of them, as well as Kay, are sitting in this trial. And it, there's a great deal of anxiety that's associated with that because they don't know really any of the evidence. They don't really know a lot of the information. And they don't know what's going to come out over the, the following uh, weeks or months of testimony. Now, there was hundreds of people because they only let about, well, the capacity of the courtroom was only 120, and they they overcapacitated it. I, I think that's probably not a word, but they brought more than that in. They had about 150 people in there, like media outlets that had actual credentials. But obviously, there were some media outlets who were left out in the cold, as well as, you know, the public who had been following this. And so hundreds of people who had not been allowed in the courtroom, they stood outside. And they stood outside, like, every day of this trial waiting to hear secondhand information about what was happening inside. Now, Ferris Wharton, who was the assistant U.S. attorney at that time, he gave the opening statements, and he laid out the case against Tom for about an hour and a half, going through the timeline, reading excerpts from Anne Marie's diary, and introducing pieces of evidence that had emerged throughout the investigation. Ferris Wharton solemnly looked each jury member in the eyes and said, quote, the evidence will show you, ladies and gentlemen, that the man she described as a controlling, manipulative, insecure, jealous maniac would not allow her to decide with whom to spend the rest of her life. The evidence will show you, ladies and gentlemen, that Tom Capano murdered Anne Marie Fahey. End quote. Joe O'Terry was up next, and he spent the better part of an hour painting Anne Marie, the victim, as a woman who should have known better, a woman who was dishonest with her friends, her family, and even with herself. He then moved on to Jerry Capano, calling him a typical, screwed up rich kid who'd never had to earn anything in his life. I mean, no lies detected there. Am I right? O'Terry said that Jerry's brain was fried from all the drugs he had taken, and he said that Jerry suffered from something called confabulation. Now, this confabulation thing, it's introduced during opening statements, but O'Terry and the rest of the, the dream team, the crew, they are going to bring it up constantly and to an annoying extent. O'Terry explained that confabulation is a process where black holes and blank spaces begin to appear in the mind and the memory of a habitual drug user. So these drug users will remember certain things about events or conversations, but they don't remember everything, so they just make things up to fill in those blanks. Now, Joe O'Terry said that Tom's other brother, Lewis, was a pathological liar who was known to make deals with law enforcement just to get himself out of trouble once again. No lies detected. And then O'Terry turned to Debbie McIntyre, thundering on about how it was stunning that this woman was able to get full immunity considering her involvement. Now, he's doing this on purpose, right? He's sort of alluding to things, and he wants the jury to know right from the get, right from day one, right from opening statements, that Debbie McIntyre has made a deal with law enforcement and with the prosecution. Because just in general, and I think this is quite common, when we hear a witness, whether it be for the defense or the prosecution, has gotten a deal of some kind in exchange for their testimony, we naturally suspect that it might not always be true. So it's actually smart what he did, trying to sort of already cast reasonable doubt. And then O'Terry dropped a bomb on the court. And he did this so casually that it went unnoticed by many in attendance. He said, quote, you are going to hear testimony that Anne-Marie Fahey is dead. You're going to hear testimony that Tom Capano did not murder Anne-Marie Fahey, premeditated or any other way. He did not murder her. Anne-Marie Fahey died as a result of an outrageous, horrible, tragic accident that only one other person who was there knows everything that happened that night, and that Tom Capano and his brother Jerry disposed of Anne-Marie Fahey's body by placing it in a cooler and taking it to sea and sinking it, end quote. Now, this was a bombshell because although we have become familiar with the facts of the case, 
We also have to remember that Tom Capano had been vehemently denying knowing anything about where Anne Marie was or what had happened to her. He had been saying that he had not killed her. He said the last time he'd seen Anne Marie, she was alive and well. He said that the story which Jerry had told was completely fabricated. So this was an almost complete 180. Almost. In a similar fashion to Casey Anthony's lawyer, Jose Baez, O'Terry had introduced a completely new theory during the trial that no one had ever heard of before, that Anne-Marie was dead, but it had been an accident that Tom had covered up, motivated by fear for himself, uh, his desire to protect himself, and those he cared about. So he didn't kill her, but he did hide her body, get rid of her body, because he didn't want this other person who was with him that night to get in trouble. And just as Jose Baez's new theory had firmly placed all responsibility off of his client, O'Terry's did the same. Of course, Tom was going to try and blame someone else, and that someone else was Debbie McIntyre. When Debbie took the stand, Tom's lawyer, Eugene Morrow Jr., asked her, quote, didn't you go to 2303 Grant Avenue on June 27th or 28th with a firearm to visit Tom, end quote. Debbie was like, um, no. <laughs> she said that on the night of the 27th, she'd arrived home after swim club. She had a swim club meet, and she hadn't left again until she went to work the next morning. Tom Capano's version of events for the evening of June 27th were different, and he took the stand to tell them himself on December 16th, 1998, even though his lawyers said, you should not take that stand, okay? And Tom was like, what are you talking about? I'm super likable. And they were like, no, you're not. And he's like, yes, everyone loves me. And they were like, no, they don't. And he's like, trust me, guys. You don't know me. You don't know my life. People fall in love with me like, whoa, and it's going to be okay. I got this. I know what I'm doing. Before Tom began speaking, O'Terry had him list for the jury all the medications he was currently taking in prison for his poor mental state. Xanax, Wellbutrin, Lomatil. He claimed that these medications would make his brain foggy and it would cause him to lose focus. He had a hard time concentrating on things, so he wanted to let the jury know what he was taking in case he started to ramble. And really, I just think Tom rambles when he's making shit up as he goes along. But, you know, he had to figure out, like, a scientific reason to explain that. Capano then went on to complain about the way he had been portrayed as a silly rich kid born with a silver spoon. He said that was not true. He had come from a life that was built by the hands of his blue-collar immigrant ancestors. He wanted the jury to understand that he was more like his forefathers than his brother Jerry, who was actually a silly rich kid. Jerry was a man who acted like a child. He spent money on stupid things like nine jet skis, and everybody would say to him, Jerry, why do you need nine jet skis? And Jerry would say, because I can. He said that he had never told Jerry that he was being extorted. He'd simply asked him for an $8,000 loan, and that money was actually for Anne Marie, who wanted to go into some treatment facility, and he was going to pay for it because it was expensive. But then when he gave her the money, she threw it in his face. But when he asked for the loan, Jerry had asked him, what was it for? Because he says Jerry's really nosy, right? And Tom was like, oh, don't worry about it. And so Jerry started guessing what it could be for. And he brought up multiple different reasons of why Tom would need this money. And by the time Jerry had stumbled upon this extortionist theory, Tom was just so annoyed and fed up with this whole song and dance that he was like, yeah, 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 that's it. And that was when Jerry had told Tom, listen, brother, if someone's bothering you, I'll have their legs broken. And when Jerry said this, Tom claims he laughed it off because his brother was always saying silly things like that. Tom said he had not asked Jerry to borrow a gun. Jerry had offered it because of the extortionists. So Tom had taken the gun, but he soon became uncomfortable about having it in the house with his daughters, so he returned it unused. Tom did admit to having a conversation with Jerry about having no problem killing someone if they threatened his daughters. And his own attorney, Joe O'Terry, who was like examining him, he cringed. And he kept trying to like interrupt him and get him off the path, but Tom... I guess thought he was saying something righteous, thought he was saying something that the jury could understand. But admitting to being open to murder for any reason, it wasn't the best thing to talk about, I guess, when you were on trial for murder. You know, I think most of us in day-to-day -day life can say flippantly, offhandedly, like if anybody tries to hurt my kids, like I'm going to take them out. I think we understand that, but when you're sitting in front of a jury who's going to judge you on whether or not you're a murderer, like maybe just leave that for, for another time, you know, another time.
So after Tom had testified, they took a break, and then he was going to come back and testify more. But during the break, Tom's Florida lawyer, Jack O'Donnell, he rushed outside to light a cigarette um, as soon as he could because he was, like, super stressed out about Tom's testimony. And O'Donnell was accosted by a reporter who stuck a microphone in his face. And the reporter was like, you know, how long is Tom going to be on the stand? Like, what's he saying? Blah, blah, blah. And O'Donnell lit his cigarette and he looked at the reporter and he said, quote, if he'd just kept his effing mouth shut, we had either an acquittal or a hung jury. But he has to talk. End quote. Yes, Tom does have to talk. And thank God for that, because in the end, he dug his own grave. On day two of his testimony, Tom Capano talked shit about Debbie McIntyre for several hours. Uh, there's letters I, I don't want to go too deep into it because it's not super relevant. It speaks to Tom and the way he treats people, the way he views people uh, as, as, you know, tools, instruments, possessions, means to an end, disposable. But I do want to bring it up just quickly because while Tom was writing to Debbie McIntyre while he was in prison and telling her he loved her and, you know, you're going to be the best witness for me, he was writing to his other girlfriend, Susan Louth, and saying the most disgusting horrible things about Debbie, like just telling Susan all sorts of personal things. Um, oof, it's very uncomfortable. But this is the kind of person that Tom is. He'll be smiling at your face because he needs something from you behind your back. He's talking shit about you because he doesn't respect you. And the funny thing is Susan Louth, um, Susan had actually met Tom's mother before, Marguerite. And Marguerite wasn't a fan of Susan Louth, I guess. She would call her, um, you know, a little slut. So whenever Tom would show up without Susan, Marguerite would be like, where's the little slut? Or Tom would be going out to dinner and Marguerite would be like, oh, who are you going out to dinner with? The little slut. Which, I mean, m might give us a little tip, a little hint a little pullback of the curtains to how Tom Capano got his disdain for women and took to calling them sluts and whores and things like that. So thanks, Mom. So I guess the point I was getting at is even though he's he's talking trash about Debbie McIntyre to Susan Louth, he most likely was talking trash about Susan Louth to somebody else. But anyways, on day two, He's, he's talking trash about Debbie McIntyre on the stand for like several hours. He said that he had never wanted to have an affair with her. She had just been the aggressor. And he was just this little victim of her feminine powers. And this is a narrative that men like Tom have. Um, they view women as like sirens, vixens, you know, who are just put here to tempt them, to seduce them. And that's garbage. Obviously and objectively, women are very powerful, right? We're very powerful beings. <laughs> Don't mean to toot my own horn, but I'm not. I'm tooting womanhood's horn. Women are powerful. We bring life into the world. We can carry and sustain life, and then we can feed that life once they are born and here so we can raise them into adulthood. That's very important. Now, obviously, men contribute to that as well. But back in the old days, you know, like biblical times, I think that men were super threatened by women because of that power. So they had to tinge that power with something illicit, like, oh, they're just sex demons, you know? And it kind of carried down from generation to generation. But that's just sort of a theory, a theory that I believe. Now, obviously, me and most people, including you guys, would be really put off by hearing Tom talk about any woman like that, much less somebody that he had been seeing steadily for over a decade. So this was where things started to go off the rails. Tom had stacked the jury with pretty young women and people from working class backgrounds. He didn't want anybody who was really college educated. He didn't want anybody who would like wear a suit to work, things like that. And his whole, I guess, reasoning was that he wanted to show these people that he wasn't this affluent playboy who thought he was above the law. He was just like them, a hardworking man who loved his family more than anything in the world and would do anything to protect them. But then he went on to talk about the fact that he'd been seeing several women while married to his wife. But he said he loved Kay so much and he respected her so much that he inconvenienced himself, making sure to always take his girlfriends out of Delaware so as not to bring embarrassment to his beloved wife, who he was cheating on constantly. And every single person in that room in the jury box was like, 
Um, <laughs> cheating on your wife does not equate to respect. Cheating on your wife and bringing your girlfriends out of state equates to you not wanting to be caught, not you caring about, you know, Kay's reputation. Tom said that he had been seeing Anne-Marie and he felt that he was falling in love with her, but he knew it wasn't fair to her because they could never be together because he loved Kay. So he was the one who had ended the relationship at the end of 1994, but Anne-Marie was not ready to lose him, not then or ever. When he tried to cut off communication with her, she overwhelmed overwhelmed him with phone calls and emails, and eventually he allowed Anne-Marie, the siren, the vixen, just like Debbie, to lure him back to her. I'm sure these young, attractive women in the jury were looking at Tom, and they were like, why? Why do you think all these women are just, like, exercising their womenly goddess powers to lure you in, of all people? Like, listen, I don't like to talk about people's physical appearance because I truly think that there's something beautiful in everybody, physically, um, internally, whatever. But Tom, it's not like he's Brad Pitt up there, right? It's not like he's Bradley Cooper up there. It's not like he's Selma Hayek up there, okay? Like, he's an older guy. There's nothing really, he's not ugly, but there's nothing, like, outstanding about him where you'd be walking down the street and you'd be like, God, his power is activated. Get that man. You know, so for him to be talking about all of these women who he would try to get away with because he knew it wasn't right, but they would pull him back in to their Black Widow web, The jury must have seen, once again, this pattern that Tom doesn't ever take accountability for anything. He cheated on his wife, but it wasn't his fault. It was the women's fault. Then Tom began to talk about that fateful night, June 27th. He said that Anne-Marie had been in a bad mood because she felt she was getting overcharged for her medications, which is why she had been quiet and withdrawn during dinner at the Restaurante Panorama. After dinner, they went to Anne-Marie's apartment to try to watch ER, but he said it was too hot in the apartment because the AC wasn't working, which we know is a contradiction, right? Because he said he checked the AC that night and it was working fine. Just one of the many contradictions that Tom will come up with because he was rambling many times and he was making it up as he went along. So the AC is not working, it's hot. So they decided to go to Tom's rented house on Grant Avenue, where they settled in for a quiet evening on the couch with George Clooney. Now during ER, his phone rang. It was Debbie McIntyre asking to come over, but Tom told her he had company and he hung up the phone. Tom said, quote, the next thing I knew, Debbie McIntyre was in the room. She must have entered the front door. She had a key to my house and I had a key to her house. I even had a garage door opener for her house and she was pretty ballistic, end quote. Tom testified that when Debbie saw him and Anne-Marie cuddling on the pink sofa with pineapples on it, she lost it. She yelled, who is this? What's going on? Is this why I couldn't come over? What's happening here? You're making a fool of me. And Anne-Marie obviously became uncomfortable with this situation. So she sat up and she grabbed her pantyhose that she apparently didn't have on. And Anne-Marie declared that she was going to leave. But then Debbie pulled a gun out of her purse and she held it up. And Tom said that at that point, Anne-Marie had laughed and continued to put her stockings on. And then Debbie, with the gun in her hand, brought it up and she said, I'm going to take my own life. So Tom said he jumped off the couch. He sprang towards Debbie. He grabbed her arm, causing the gun to discharge and a bullet to lodge in Anne-Marie's head right above her ear. He and Debbie began freaking out, trying to revive Anne-Marie, but she was gone. Tom said, quote, It was like my whole life flashed before me. If you're in a situation like that, you just start, everything is, oh my God, Debbie is crying and she's hysterical and I want to calm her down and I'm thinking of, as I said, my own life flashing before my eyes and I always thought I was a guy with some guts, but I wasn't and I'm just being selfish too, to protect myself and also to protect Debbie and so since I knew the paramedics could not do anything, I knew Anne-Marie was dead, I chose not to call the paramedics or the police, but to protect myself and to the extent that I could protect Debbie, end quote. Wow, what a stand-up guy, man. I mean, he's he's been sitting in, in prison behind bars for like over a year for Debbie, the woman he was writing these horrible things about to Susan Louth. Like, why would you take the fall for someone so horrible? Wow, Tom, he really is a saint. Tom went on to explain what happened after Anne-Marie was shot. He said, quote, I broke down. I fell apart, and I cried, and I screamed at myself, and I punched the wall. And after about five minutes of that, I did something I'm capable of doing. I compartmentalized. And then I just said, I have to do something. What am I going to do? And the first thing I have to do is take care of Anne-Marie's body, 
end quote. Now, when this theory first came out, I do want to mention one side note. When this theory first came out in court and Joe O'Terry left the courtroom after it dropped and the press and the media are outside the courtroom, you know, and they were like, why did Tom dump Anne Marie's body off a boat? Like, why did he get rid of it like that? And Joe O'Terry sort of smiled and chuckled. And he was like, well, he couldn't very well leave her in his house. And I didn't like that. I'm just going to say that I don't like it. I think defense attorneys can sometimes be very desensitized and um, compassionless towards people in general, maybe because of their line of work. But if you're if you're like that, it's time to find a new line of work because nothing's worth losing your humanity. I don't care how much money you're getting paid. I don't care how much fame you're getting. I don't care how many times your stupid face is on CNN. Nothing is worth losing your humanity. So Tom Capano thought that he had really done something here. He thought that he had offered the jury a logical and believable alternate story for what had happened to Anne Marie, a story that he felt explained all the evidence law enforcement had found. Of course, it didn't. There was all this evidence that Debbie was not at his house that night. There was evidence with phone calls that the two of them had between each other that that lasted, you know, longer than he said because he said he just told her he had company and he hung up. So there was evidence that Debbie was not at his house that night, but not, I guess, clear-cut evidence enough because she lived so close that I guess she could have hung up and, like, driven over in two minutes, but come on. But even though Tom thought he was making headway, he had not come face-to-face with his greatest nemesis yet, Colm Connolly. Connolly knew that Tom had ice water running through his veins, but he also knew that this ice water could be set to a boil at the right provocation. Tom hated Colm Connolly with a passion. And if anyone was going to cause Capano to lose his cool, it was going to be Connolly. So the prosecutor did everything he could to get under Tom's skin. And of course it worked, right? Because... There's something about a growing ego. As it gets bigger and bigger, the individual's self-awareness gets smaller and smaller. When Tom was testifying to the jury, he had claimed that Debbie had dropped the gun after it had been fired. But now he told Colm Connolly that he'd taken it from her hand. So Connolly asked him about this contradiction, and he was like, wait, did she drop it? Or did you take it from her hand? And Tom was rattled. And he said, quote, yes, I got it out of her hand or she handed it to me. These are not things that were burned into my memory. End quote. To which Connolly replied, quote, huh, shootings occur in your living room all the time. End quote. Now, obviously, this isn't productive. It's not a productive line of questioning if you're trying to get, like, actual answers. But Connolly wasn't trying to get actual answers. Not at this point, at least. He was trying to get Tom riled up. He was trying to get Tom off balance. So when the real questions came, it would take just a simple push of the finger to topple Tom's house of cards. Connolly also asked Tom to walk through the timeline again and again and again. The timeline before the incident, the timeline during and after. And unlike Tom's own lawyers, who kind of glossed over certain details and were going very easy on Tom, Colm Connolly made Tom go over every step in minutia, hoping that the jury was going to be able to envision Tom stuffing the body of the woman he claimed to love into a three by eight cooler. So especially during that part, the disposal, Colm made sure that Tom was very specific. And if Tom wasn't specific enough, Colm would make him go back and be more specific about the way things looked, the way they smelled, what he felt, how he did it, etc. And this was very much stressing Tom Capano out. And then Colm Connolly did something that I personally think was brilliant. He reminded Tom about a case that Tom had prosecuted in 1976. Because remember, this was Tom Capano's first time in the witness box as like, you know, a a criminal, a person who was on trial. He was usually on the other side. He was usually in Colm Connolly's shoes. And I really think that this was another reason why Tom hated Colm so much was because Colm Connolly was doing what Tom had been doing, but Colm Connolly was doing it right. He was motivated. He was dedicated. He was young. He had his whole career in front of him, yet he had already made a name for himself, and he was doing it with the right morals and the right values. He wasn't cheating on his wife. He wasn't making deals, you know, back alley deals with politicians behind the scenes. He was a good person, and Tom couldn't stand it. So this 1976 case that Tom had prosecuted included a man named Squeaky Saunders, who was on trial for murdering another man named Joseph Spoon Johnson. Uh, Capano had called in a firearms expert 
for this case who Capano then questioned while this expert was on the stand. And through this questioning, through this line of questioning, Capano and the expert were able to establish through ballistics and bullet trajectory that Squeaky Saunders had been the one to fire the first of the three shots that had took Joe Johnson's life. So Connolly pointed out to Tom that the crime in that case was strikingly similar to the story that Tom was now telling about his own crime. Saunders had shot Joe Johnson about two inches from the ear, and that was where Anne Marie had been shot. Saunders and his accomplices had also disposed of the body in a Delaware City Creek, hoping and planning for it to flow down the river and end up in the Atlantic Ocean where it would never be recovered. At this point, Capano shut down. He became very, like, angsty. And every time Connolly asked a question about the Saunders case, Capano growled back that he wasn't going to discuss that case. And as the questioning went on, the dynamic between the witness, Tom, and the prosecutor, Colm Connolly, it changed. Tom was no longer waiting for a question to be asked before he opened his mouth to speak. He became argumentative, and Colm Connolly would ask questions, and Tom would, like, interrupt his question to shoot back his own questions in response to Connolly's questions. Judge Swain Lee had to interrupt the proceedings several times to tell Tom to chill out. And <laughs> this is why I love the judge, man. He made a comment to the jury. He's like, I don't know what Mr. Capano's doing, but he knows better. He was a lawyer after all. Now, obviously, the main pressure point for Tom was his daughters. If Connolly asked Tom about his daughters, Tom would threaten him to not go there. You know, Connolly would be like, and what about this? And Tom would be like, don't go there, like all intimidatingly. And then Connolly played the phone calls that Debbie had been recording between herself and Tom after she'd made a deal with the prosecution. Now, during one of these calls, Debbie had told Tom that she had spoken to the authorities and she had given them the truth. But Connolly asked Tom, why weren't you happy about that news? You were upset, you know, in the tape recording. You're asking her, like, why'd you do that? What exactly did you say? Tell me, like, you're clearly upset and agitated. Why wouldn't you be happy that she had told the truth, considering that you claim you're sitting behind bars for a crime you did not commit, that Debbie committed? So if the story went down as you claimed it went down, you should have been ecstatic that Debbie had come clean, which would mean your imminent release. At one point, when Connolly brought up Capano's daughters again, accusing Tom of using them to impede the investigation, which he absolutely did, Tom became visibly aggravated, and his carefully created mask of charm and control began to slip. When his attorneys interrupted the questioning to approach the bench, they were hoping that this quick break would give their client a chance to cool off. That's basically the only reason that they did it. And when his attorneys approached the bench to like buy him some time, Tom slapped his microphone to the side as if it was a bothersome fly like this. And then he began to like rant and rave using every bad name in the book to describe Colm Connolly, which the jury saw. They were privy to it. They witnessed it. And it probably felt like, why is this grown-ass man throwing a hissy fit? When the questioning resumed, Colm Connolly drove right back into the topic of Capano's daughters, realizing that he had hit a nerve. And this prompted Tom to scream, to scream at Connolly that he was a heartless, gutless, soulless disgrace of a human being. And when Connolly attempted to respond, Tom cut him off, screaming some more like a maniac. Judge Swain Lee ordered Tom Capano removed from the courtroom, and as he was being taken out, like they're dragging him out, he turned back and he yelled, He's a liar! How embarrassing, right? Embarrassing! Judge Swain Lee would later say he understood why Tom was sensitive about his daughters, but he was truly surprised at how little it had taken to cause Tom to totally lose it on the stand. Because usually this is the place, once again, you're being judged, there's a jury, judging you. So this is a place where even the person with like the most volatile temper will use logic to to keep themselves calm because they don't want to look like somebody who snaps and kills somebody. For some of those in attendance, it was not a surprise, Tom's behavior. You know, Tom's family had known him long enough to recognize this behavior and these behavior patterns easily. But for those who were not familiar with Tom, the sight of him crumbling and turning red in the face and screaming and reverting into a wailing, flailing, out-of-control man-child, it was chilling. The trial continued for 12 weeks, and then the jury was sent out to a Wilmington hotel so that they could deliberate. Surprisingly, 
the jury felt that Jerry Capano was a credible witness, and they had been really annoyed by the amount of times that the defense had used the word confabulation. They were not so sure about Debbie McIntyre, however, probably because the defense had used her as their reasonable doubt. Let's throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. One of the jurors, Erin Riley, who was a young woman in her 20s, she said, quote, I could see her coming into Capano's home and doing it. The prosecution made her look like a weak, fragile person, and I don't think she's that. Part of me could also see why Capano wouldn't want everything about him coming out, everybody knowing he was such a sleazeball. And you know the old saying, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, end quote. The jury also took turns handling a 22 caliber Beretta pistol that had been provided to them. Now, obviously, this was not the actual gun that had been used to kill Anne-Marie. That weapon had never been located, but it was an exact replica of that weapon. And the jury decided to use it in order to reenact the shooting, as Tom had described it, to see how possible it was. Because during the trial, Ferris Wharton had told the jury that Tom jumping off the sofa and getting to Debbie fast enough to redirect her shot, it wasn't really physically possible. Especially not in the way that Tom had initially said it went down. Like, if you believe Tom, everything that he said happened between Debbie pulling the gun out, Anne-Marie laughing about it and continuing to put on her stockings, Tom diving off the couch to, to grab the gun out of Debbie's hand, that would have all had to happen in, like, three seconds. I'm going to read you a passage from the book called Fatal Embrace. This is a book written about Anne-Marie's case by award-winning journalist Chris Barish and author Peter Meyer. So, quote, two jurors sat on a small couch in their deliberation suite. Another walked up, held the Beretta at his side. The juror closest to the gun stood up and attempted to grab the gun as it was raised in the air, just as Ferris Wharton had told them it couldn't be done unless the person raised the gun at a snail's pace. Several jurors also tried to load the ammunition clip in the gun and were shocked by how much strength it took. Others were amazed by how much pressure was needed to cock the trigger. A few of the women couldn't even do it. Riley said, it hurts your fingers, end quote. Now, they also brought the cooler in, and I think the cooler was very impactful. And I'm going to talk about that that young woman, the juror, Riley, again. Um, they brought the cooler in, and Riley was about the same height and weight as Anne-Marie. I think she may have been an inch or two shorter. But she opened the cooler, and she, she t attempted to get into it. And she realized that while it was physically possible, it would mean a lot of things. It would mean a lot of squishing, a lot of bone breaking, a lot of manipulation of this body in order to get it into the cooler. And that was impactful because once again, you can say it was an accident what happened to Anne-Marie, but your, your treatment of her body and your behavior afterwards shows that you didn't really have a ton of care for this woman because if you had loved her, you wouldn't have treated her body like this. At the end of their time together, the jury unanimously decided to vote guilty. Now, when the courthouse clerk stuck her head outside the courtroom to inform the gathering public about the verdict, cheers could be heard like a roll of thunder surging around the courthouse. When Debbie McIntyre emerged, she made a brief statement, and she said, quote, I have nothing to say to Tom. I do not love Tom Capano at all, end quote. It's about time, Debbie. Three days later, Tom Capano, who had received the news of his verdict with a blank and emotionless face, he once again arrived at the courthouse to hear his sentence. The two options were life in prison or death by lethal injection. Now, Judge Swain Lee would have the final say, but he respected the jury who had given their time and their consideration to this case, so he was planning to put a lot of weight behind what they thought Tom's sentence should be. Now, in Delaware, at least, the jury used to decide the the sentences of the defendants but i think it was 94 or 96 they stopped doing that because of a certain case that caused a lot of controversy but certain judges who do value the jury value their opinion value them as intelligent human beings they allow them to to weigh in on that decision now during the sentencing hearing you'll usually have people who come up both for the victim and for the defendant and, you know, talk about the impact that this whole thing has had on their families. It's the victim impact statement as far as Anne Marie's family would go. And for Tom's family, it would be his loved ones coming up and saying why they thought the jury should give Tom life in prison instead of the death sentence. Both Lewis and Jerry Capano spoke to the judge and jury with tears welling up in their eyes and streaming down their faces, and they asked the jury to save their brother's life. 
Jerry said, quote, this is horrible, horrible for the Fahey's, horrible for us. I miss him. This is not the Tom I knew. He is not the Tom I grew up with who I went to for advice. I don't know what happened to him, but something happened, end quote. Now, Tom's ex-wife, Kay, also spoke to the jury, and she said, quote, I'm not here to stand by my man. I am as repulsed by his vile acts as anyone here. But for everything he has done, he has been a loving father, end quote. Now, Tom's mother, Marguerite, that old wildcat, <laughs> she was over 70, and she was at this point relegated to a wheelchair. She wheeled herself out in front of the jury, and, uh, and she said, quote, My son is not a murderer. He is not guilty of killing Anne-Marie. I feel sorry for her, but he didn't do it. He's too good a person to hurt anybody. He did wrong by not calling 911 when she was hurt, but he didn't do it. I don't care what anybody says, and nobody will ever convince me that he did. I love him. I need him. Please don't kill my son. Please spare my son for me and for his family and for his daughters. End quote. And okay, listen, I made a little fun of Marguerite, um, admittedly. I couldn't help it. Typically, I would have quite a bit of compassion, and I do have quite a bit of compassion for the families of both the victim and the perpetrator because they didn't do it. But when this happens, similarly to the Cindy Anthony, Casey Anthony escapade where like no matter what evidence came out, no matter what was staring Cindy Anthony in the face, she continued to proclaim from the rooftops that Casey was innocent and had done nothing wrong. Marguerite is an enabler. And I guess we could say maybe this is why Tom turned out the way he turned out. It's not an excuse, certainly not, but it's some insight, some context. And I have a problem with Marguerite be just being like straight out during this time when the verdict's already been come to. It's done and over with. You saw the evidence, lady. Don't tell me that none of that struck a chord with you. You know, like at this point, you're being willfully ignorant. You're enabling him. And the fact that she said, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what evidence there is. I will never believe it. If that's how he was raised, then yeah, why would he ever expect any consequences? You know, Marguerite was the mother who would get a call from like Tom's school and they'd be like, uh, Tom set fire to the library. And then Tom would come home from school and she'd be like, hey, honey, did you set fire to the library today? And Tom would be like, no, they're attacking me and they're trying to blackmail me. Somebody else did it. And then Marguerite would like march into school and be like, my son told me what you're doing. And he did not do this. He is not guilty of this. Stop persecuting us. This is who Marguerite is. And parents like that, they don't raise children who uh, know what the word accountability means. And then Tom Capano, he addressed the jury. And like I said, you always think that he can't be any less self-aware or any less full of ego, but he will constantly prove you wrong. Tom said, quote, I hope you can appreciate it is pretty difficult for me to speak to people who have already rejected me. Yeah, okay, Tom. Tom, we already know. You don't speak to people who have rejected you. You just try to have them killed or you kill them yourself. He continued, quote, in your mind, you say to yourself, what's the use? You've made your decision, and I'd be less than honest if I didn't say we're still reeling from it, end quote. He's such an idiot. During the trial, one of the big points that the prosecution made was that Tom did not take rejection well, that being rejected was a big pressure point for him. Being rejected was the reason he had killed Anne-Marie, and the first words out of his mouth to the jury who are going to decide his fate is that they rejected him? How did they reject him? How did they reject you, Tom? They never accepted you. Y'all weren't friends. Y'all weren't dating. You're not family. How can a complete stranger reject you? They didn't believe you. They thought you were lying. But those two things aren't the same. Rejection and knowing when a liar is lying, not even in the same ballpark. The jury heard the evidence and they made a decision. It's as simple as that. There was no rejection involved. This guy is crazy. And then Tom goes on to use the same gaslighting tactics that he'd used on Anne-Marie and the other women he had manipulated into thinking he was a good person over the course of his life. He tried to guilt the jury. He tried to make himself the victim. I keep thinking in my head, what's even the use of talking? What's even the use of telling you my side because you've already made your decision and I'm reeling from it? You know, like, ugh. Tried to make himself the victim. But then, of course, he does go on to talk to them for quite a long time. But you know what he didn't do? You know what Tom Capano never did? 
apologize. He never said, I'm sorry. Not just that he was sorry for what he had done to Anne Marie. If he didn't want to confess that, whatever. But he never even looked at her family and told them that he was sorry for the loss of her in their lives. He talked a lot about himself, what a great father he was, what a dedicated public servant he was, what a fervent Catholic and amazing person who'd been slandered by the media and law enforcement. He said, quote, I don't know the guy that's been betrayed, portrayed, portrayed in this courtroom, and I don't even know the guy now that stands before you, end quote. Once again, an unconscious slip of the tongue revealing Tom's true issue. He said, I don't even know the man who's been betrayed. And then he switched them. He was like, I mean, portrayed. (laughs) He had not been maligned by the media or the police. So he couldn't possibly be mad about the way he'd been portrayed because it wasn't true. He was portrayed quite accurately. He truly did feel betrayed because he'd gone into that courtroom thinking he was going to dazzle the pants off the jury, razzle dazzle, and they were going to look at him and be blinded by his charm and status and intelligence and wit and look at his glowing smile and he's such a good guy. The fact that they had seen through him, that was viewed by Tom as a betrayal because he's delusional just like his mother. The jury would now have to decide Tom Capano's fate. Would it be life in a cage or would his life be taken away while the victims of his crimes looked on? In Delaware, the aggravating factor of premeditation must be present in order to sentence a person to death. And 11 of the 12 jurors voted that they believed Tom had put substantial planning into his crime. And 10 out of the 12 jurors voted for him to be put to death. Several weeks later, Judge Swain Lee addressed Tom and the court, saying, quote, Tom Capano does not face judgment today because friends and family failed him. He faces judgment because he is a ruthless murderer who feels compassion for no one and remorse only for the circumstances in which he finds himself. He is a malignant force from whom no one he deems disloyal or adversarial can be secure, even if he is incarcerated for the rest of his life. No one, except the defendant, will ever know exactly how or why Anne-Marie Fahey died. What is certain is that it was not a crime of passion, but rather a crime of control. By all accounts, she had ceased to be the defendant's lover, but had never escaped his sphere of influence, control, and manipulation. Anne-Marie could not be permitted to end the relationship unless he said so. She could not be allowed to reject him. He chose to destroy a possession rather than lose it to execute an escaping human chattel, end quote. The judge agreed that the jury's recommendation of the death sentence was justifiable, and so Tom was put on death row. Yay! And that's the end of the story. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because, of course, someone like Tom Capano was not going to accept his fate and be like, well, you gave it a good run, old boy, but you got caught, and now it's time to face the music. No, that's not Tom Capano. He filed an appeal in March of 2006, and he was claiming a bunch of stuff, claiming the media slandered him, claiming he had an ineffective counsel because I guess like sometimes his lawyers were like rolling their eyes when he wasn't looking because he was being ridiculous. So to save everyone the time and expense of a trial and to save everyone the t- torture of listening to Tom ramble on about himself again, the prosecution approached Anne Marie's siblings and asked basically for permission to downgrade his death sentence to life in prison. And they were like, yeah, we don't care. We don't care if he's alive or dead. We just don't want him out on the streets where he can hurt other people. I may not have been so understanding. By that time, Ferris Warren had been promoted to district attorney, and he told the judge that it didn't really matter because Tom was going to die in prison, which was as it should be, and Warren's prediction would come true sooner than anyone expected. In September of 2011, Thomas Capano was found dead in his cell from a sudden cardiac arrest. His health had been poor for a while. He was not being healthy with himself. He wasn't being active. And he was eating constantly. He'd gained a massive amount of weight since his trial. Judge Swain Lee believes that Capano killed himself, saying, quote, He ate himself to death. There's no question about it. His father died of a heart attack. He knew he had a heart condition. Once his appeals ran out, I think it was suicide by food. End quote. We all seem able to deal with our mortality, even though we seem to be the only creatures on earth who can realize what's happening. We give little thought to that ride on a pale horse because we don't know when it will come, always confident it won't be today. These are the words 
that Tom Capano said to the jury during his sentencing hearing. And, I mean, I guess that day came for him eventually in 2011. And I have to say, I'm not even a little bit sad about it. I'm sad for his daughters. I'm sad for his family, um, even his mother, who is delusional and an enabler. I'm still sad for her because nobody wants to, to lose their child. Now, she may not have even been alive at that time. Actually, she was. She was alive at that time. She died peacefully in her home on Monday, February 4th, 2013, at the age of 89. So when her son Tom died in prison, she was still alive. So I do. I feel bad for her. I don't, you know, I'm not a a malicious person uh, who's like, screw you. You don't deserve to feel sad. People deserve to feel sad when people they care about die, even if the person they cared about wasn't a good person. I'm mostly, obviously, sad for Anne-Marie's family, though. It's very sad that Anne-Marie will never be found, that she and what happened to her sunk beneath the waves of the Atlantic, never to be recovered, never to be rescued, never to be laid to rest in a place where her beloved family could visit her and talk to her and imagine for one moment that she was with them. Anne-Marie was a woman who was so afraid of being alone that she constantly compromised her own needs and her own boundaries to make sure she never would be. And she ended up in the most lonely place that she could have. Lonely, dark, deep, cold, all the things that Anne-Marie ran from during her life. It's truly devastating. But in this situation, I do have to give thanks for Tom Capano and his ever-growing ego. Because if he had been smarter, if he'd been more cunning and less up his own ass, he may have gotten away with this. And not knowing where Anne-Marie was on top of her killer getting to continue to live his life as if she had never existed, I think that would have been too much for any of us. So before I sign off, I did want to give a shout out to my patrons. Um, I told them that I would start, you know, reading out a couple of their comments during each video because they they have really great comments, like not just kind, sweet comments, comments of support and love, but also, you know, very uh, interesting and insightful comments. So uh, each video, I'm going to read out a couple of comments that they put on Patreon and uh, just give them a shout out and thanks because... I really appreciate them. So there's a bunch of new patrons, and I'm so pumped. So I, I actually want to uh, shout them out. Um, and then obviously, like, my OG patrons. It doesn't mean I love you guys any less, but I do want to shout out a couple of the ones who popped in recently and said that they had just joined the Patreon because they wanted to get access early to part four because they didn't want to wait till the next day. And that's, like, the sweetest thing ever, man. Like, that you are that interested in the content that you don't even want to wait a day, you have no idea. Like the Grinch, my heart swelled multiple times. So Sierra Williams said, I too joined your Patreon due to not being able to wait until tomorrow to watch it. I had been checking multiple times a day these few days to see if it had been posted. I have been unsubscribed and sometimes don't get the notifications of your new videos. Hence, my new subscription to your Patreon. Now I'm anxiously awaiting the last part. Thank you so much, Sierra. Yes, YouTube um, likes to unsubscribe people from my channel and they also like to not notify you when I post, so... Gray Ditch says, I'm so glad to be able to support you on here as well. Already subscribed to the Crime Weekly Patreon and didn't know you had one too until you posted about it on YouTube. The quality of your content is the best. Love from France. Bonjour and merci. Aaron Siha says, this case is absolutely crazy. I literally had to stop the video and yell, what? Several times, I'm eager to know the conclusion. Well, here it is, Aaron. Thank you so much for being a patron. And one last one, Julesi says, I joined your Patreon for this video and you came through in spades. Your content is so well thought out and compelling. I'm so glad I started your Patreon. I am so glad as well. Welcome to all new Patreons. Much love to you guys. Much love to my OG Patreons. Um, That's about all that I have. Don't forget to check out Crime Weekly. Link is in the description box. I paid a lot of money for the shout out, all right? So to myself, no, I'm kidding. No money exchanged hands. No money. I was not paid for my opinion on this podcast. But anyway, check the link in the description box. Follow me on social media. My handles are in the description box. Some new coffee and crime times are going to be coming your way. I also have an exciting new announcement for February, a new series I'm starting that I know you will love. I know you will love it because I have been planning it and working on it. It has been in the works for half a year at this point. And so I know you're going to love it because I put a lot of work and effort into it. And 
I think it's going to be really good. So I'm going to announce that next month. I'm super excited. Stay tuned for that. Also, stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe. Please don't date anybody named Tom Capano, and I will see you next time. Bye. I got blood